So we have seen how to represent integers, positive and negative, in a computer. We have also seen how to represent real numbers and text and be able to compress text in a computer system. Now we're going to cover how to represent audio and video. So what is exactly is the audio information? Well, we perceive sound when a series of air compressions vibrate a membrane in our ear, which sends signals to our brain. So that's a very important <clears throat> aspect because we only perceive sound on air. In a vacuum, we wouldn't be perceiving sounds. And also, that's when those air compressions vibrate our ear, which sends signals to the to our brain. So we're going to see some characteristics of those compressions and of those vibrations and how much does the human ear perceive as far as sound is concerned. So a stereo sends an electrical signal to a speaker to reproduce that sound. So this signal is an anal analog representation of the sound wave. And there is voltage, voltage in the signal that varies in direct proportion to the sound wave. So high voltage means high pitch sounds and vice versa. So what we do with computers is we digitize the signal by sampling it. So periodically we measure the voltage and we record the numeric value. And sometimes that periodically means a very high frequency. So as an example, a sampling rate of about 40,000 times per second is enough to create a reasonable sound reproduction. That's a lot of sampling per, per second. But the human ear is capable of differentiating with samples less than that um, frequency. Now, that audio is burned on a CD, for instance. <clears throat> and so all the CD has is, since it's digital, that's what it, it, it means. It's a compact disc um, where the digital information is being recorded. All it does is it records ones and zeros or highs and lows. And the laser beam from the CD makes the um, laser bounce back into a receptor which detects whether it's a one or a zero. That's basically how it works. Now, if the sampling rate is less than 40,000 times per second, some of the data is lost. That's how perceptive, perceptive the ear is to the sound. <clears throat> but a reasonable sound is reproduced. So you know that some of the peaks sounds will be lost. But still, for the human ear, you know, 40,000 times per second is good enough. <clears throat> so, um, the CDs store audio information digitally. And we already saw that, that basically it transforms the analog sound, which is the waves, it transforms into digits ones and zeros. Now on the surface of the CD are microscopic pits that represent binary digits. So the uh, hills will be uh, ones and the valleys will be zeros basically. Now a low intensity laser is pointed at the rotating disk and the laser light reflects. 
strongly if the surface is smooth and poorly if the surface is pitted. <clears throat> now most of the audio formats um, used today like WAVE and AU and AIFFF and VQF and MP3, MP3 is the most common one. And these audio formats are basically the way to store digital information about audio in a compressed format. So MP3, for instance, which stands for MPEG-2 Audio Layer 3 file, is one of the most dominant ones. And, and it analyzes the frequency spread Okay, so the frequency of the of the sound, um, the highs and lows, and discards the information that cannot be heard by a human ear. So it knows exactly what frequencies could be heard and what frequencies will not be heard, and discards all the information that will not be heard by the human ear. <clears throat> and then after that the bit stream that is all the information that comes up, that comes out of that waveform that is digitized is compressed using a form of Huffman encoding and we already covered what a Huffman encoding was back when we were compressing text and that is to achieve additional compression so in some sense it's a lossy compression because it's actually getting rid of some of the original um, data, but in some other sense, it's lossless because the human ear will not be able to perceive whether it's the original sound or not. So I'm going to give you an example of a compression, an audio compression. Uh, for example, let's say we have a, a sample song, a one-minute song and we, we want to store it on our hard disk drive. So the C, we want a CD quality sample. So a CD quality sample is going to take 44 kilohertz. That means it's 44,100 values per second or 44,100 samples per second. And we want it in a stereo sound and each sample will be stored in 16 bits of information 16 bits that means two bytes so we take the 44,100 values per second multiply by two with channels which is the stereo part multiply by two bytes which is the amount of uh, bits that will take the uh, the sample to be stored in the hard drive times 60 seconds per minute because remember this this values are per second so that's times 60 seconds per minute and that's going to give us approximately 10 megabytes of one minute song so one minute song will be using 10 megabytes of hard disk that's quite a lot, um, considering that most MP3 today's today an MP3 for a five-minute song will probably take three or four megabytes. <clears throat> and the reason being is because this is not compressed. So. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of the quality and the bandwidth and the bit rate of most audio samples, for instance, the shortwave radio, which is very lousy quality uh, sound, the bandwidth is 4.5 kilohertz. That means it's, it's only 4,500 samples per second. And the bit rate, <clears throat> which is the amount of kilobits per seconds that will be that will be needed um, to store 
that sound it's 16 so it's 16 kilobits per second that's very small and then AM radio for instance is 7.5 kilohertz that's 7500 samples per second and it will take 32 kilobits per second to store it on a hard drive FM radio it's 11 kilohertz 96 kilobits per second and then near CD quality which is what we find on most mp3s is 16 kilohertz um, and it's 128 kilobits per second now there's something called the perceptual transparency which is you can really detect whether it's a CD quality or or real quality which is 20 kilohertz or 100 between 160 or 180 kilobits per second now on a studio which is where most artists record their songs um, you will see that the bandwidth is 22,000 22 kilohertz or 22,000 samples per per second and it's it, it uses 256 kilobits per second to store that kind of information <clears throat> Um, so now we move on into representing images and graphics. <clears throat> on a computer. So what is color? Color is the perception of frequencies of light that reach the retina of our eyes. So the retinas have three types of color photoreceptors or cone cells that correspond to the colors of red, green, and blue. In that sense, that's how colors are managed in a computer monitor. Actually, in a computer monitor, color is expressed as a red, green, and blue value. So there are three numbers that indicate the relative contribution of each and one of these primary colors um, so typically in RGB for short red green and blue value of 255 255 and 0 maximizes the contribution of red and green and minimizes the contribution of blue so the first digit is the value assigned to the color red and it could be any value between 0 and 255. Remember, that's the maximum value in a 2-byte. <clears throat> and then the next value is the green, also between 0 and 255. And then the last value it will be equivalent to the blue, which could also be between 0 and 255. So this 255 to 555 in 0 maximizes the contribution of red and green and minimizes the contribution of blue which results in a bright yellow as we all know green is the result of combining yellow and blue so if you maximize the green and minimize the blue you know you're gonna get yellow out of it so that's another way of, of seeing it um, and the fact that 255 value for red means it's going to be a very bright yellow. There's a 3D dimensional color space that will let us uh, <clears throat> indicate what kind of colors are being combined, whether you go into the reds, into the magentas, into the whites, into the cyans, the yellow, etc., or the blacks. <clears throat> And basically, um, this three-dimensional color space will indicate to us the color depth of each one of the of the uh, images and graphics that are going to be represented in a computer. So the color depth, for instance, is the amount of data that is used to represent a color. We have values like high color, which is a 16-bit color depth. 16-bit 16 16 bit is exactly 
uh, two bytes but only five bits are used for each number in the RGB so if only five bits are used and we are using red green and blue that's a total of 15 bits to represent the color and there's one extra bit sometimes used to represent the transparency of the image so a high color image we use two bytes 16 bits to represent the red green and blue and its transparency now there's another type of color depth called the true color which is a 24-bit color depth that means that we're using eight bits that's a total of eight bits for each number in the RGB value so we're going to be using eight bits for the red 8 bits for the green and 8 bits for the blue. That's the highest um, color depth that we can find in most monitors uh, today. <clears throat> so, a few true color red, green, and blue values, and the colors they represent will be like, for instance, 000, zero, zero is the absence of any color and that will be equivalent to the color black. The 255, which is the maximum value for each one of these, red, green, and blue, would represent the white. So, absence of color is black, full value of color is white, and then you can make all kinds of combinations of maximum and minimum or mid-size colors, of the red, green, and blue, and you can get, for instance, the yellow, or the pink, or the brown, or the purple, or the maroon, which gives us a really high amount of colors. If you think about it, it's going to be 255 combinations times 255 times 255. That's in the order of into the millions of colors for a true color depth. <clears throat> now, a browser may support only a certain number of specific colors, creating a palette from which to choose. So, for instance, the Netscape uh, browser, which is very old, Mozilla type of browser, which of which Firefox is its latest um, um, new generation, uh, is capable of of um, supporting a certain number of specific colors, <clears throat> and all the all the way to tw uh, true color, uh, which is the 24-bit uh, color. Now, as far as digitizing the images and the graphics using those colors, um, we can create um, or we can represent images of really uh, high resolution. So, how do you digitize a picture? Well, to digitize a picture is to represent it as a collection of individual dots called pixels. So, currently, for instance, uh, my computer has, if we take a look at the resolution, I have nine, 1920 by 1080. That means there is 1920 dots across the image, which is the image that you guys are visualizing in this video, by 1080 down. That's the amount of pixels that this uh, video is using to represent the images. And represented as a collection of individual dots and pixels is what's called digitizing a picture. Now, the, res the resolution is the number of pixels used to represent the picture. So, in this case, it's 1920 by 1080. And there are several ways of doing that. So there's one called the raster graphics, which the storage of data is done on a pixel by pixel basis, 
which means that the entire graphic will be saved uh, saving the information of, of the color of absolutely every single pixel in the image and examples of those are the bitmaps or called BMPs, the GIFs, the JPEGs and the PNGs they're all raster graphics so, so they will be saving the entire um, pixel by pixel information of the image but that's not the only one there's also one called the raster graphics I'm sorry the vector graphics but we'll see them later so <clears throat> let's take a look at the sorry about that the formats of the different um, raster graphics the bitmap format, for instance, contains the pixel color values of the image from left to right and from top to bottom. So bitmap actually contains the color of each one of the pixels. The GIF format, which is an index color, each image is made out of only 256 colors. So the GIF format will use much less bandwidth of colors let's say it's only it only uses 256 colors so the image will be of kind of of a less quality but it will use much less space to be saved in the JPEG format for instance the average color hues over short distances are saved so there are some kind of analysis of the color hues of the image before it's being saved in the PNG format like the GIF for instance uh, it, it achieves greater compression with wider range of color depths so PNG is sort of like a GIF but it saves a lot more than 256 colors so <clears throat> If we think about it, which one is better for line drawings? That will be GIF. Why? Because for line drawings, typically you will not use more than 256 colors. But for pictures, which is what you get out of a camera or out of a, um, a, a studio, then the best format will be JPEG because it contains pixel color values of the image but it tends to save space by doing some averages over the color hues of the image so this is an example of a whole picture it's a digitized picture composed of many individual pixels that's the image of the dog and then this is a magnified portion of the picture so as you can see this is what these are what are called the the uh, the pixels the individual pixel pixels um, and then taking a look at uh, the famous Lena picture which is uh, a picture used very commonly is the mostly used image for research and image processing it comes way back to the 60s or 50s Playboy magazine um, this Lena picture it's been analyzed in almost all the different formats available and I don't have a copy of that picture but I have a copy of another picture And I'm going to give you examples of the different formats for that picture. So I have the penguins. This is a picture, a sample picture that comes with Windows 7. And um, you can find it under your pictures folder, under my pictures folder, under sample pictures. And it's called penguins. And I have created all the different versions of this 
penguins picture in all the different formats. So I have the penguins in BMP. That's a bitmap. It uses 2,305 kilobytes. That's 2.3 megabytes, roughly. Then I've created the same version in a GIF format. The GIF only uses 326K, which is a significant reduction in space. Um, to be honest with you, it doesn't show much difference between the two because the original penguins was using only 256 colors. So the penguins GIF will not notice the difference and it will be able to save the same quality picture in one eighth the size. Then we have the Penguins JPEG, which that's the one that uses an algorithm, an average of the color hues, and it's twice the size of the GIF, but it's capable of storing much higher resolutions and much higher um, bandwidth of colors. And then finally, the Penguins PNG which is the equivalent to the GIF, but with capability of saving a lot more than 256 colors. So this PNG is about half the size, almost of a little bit more than half the size of the BMP. So that gives you an example of the same picture saved in different formats with all the different sizes that they use. Now back to our presentation. Now another um, <clears throat> another uh, way of digitizing a picture other than raster graphics is called vector graphics and it's a format that describes an image in terms of lines and geometric shapes so it's not pixels it's lines and geometric shapes this is uh, widely used in cartoons and some of the games as well a vector graphic is a series of commands that describe a line's direction, thickness, and color. So the file sizes, if you think about it, tend to be much, much smaller than any of the raster graphics because not every pixel is described in the image. So in vector graphics, basically the image is being built as lines and, and, and geometric shapes. So obviously it's going to be more um, CPU intensive in, in terms of, you know, it will require the, um, it will require the, the computer to process a lot of um, uh, mathematical calculations in the sense that it will describe it will it will calculate the lines and the thickness and the colors and all that and the geomet geometric shapes but it will use much less space because it's not saving every pixel of the image so the good side and the bad side as i mentioned the vector graf graphics can be resized mathematically and changes can be calculated dynamically as needed but vector graphics are not good for representing real world images. The quality in vector graphics for real world images is not there. I mean, you can you can see the difference um, in trying to represent real world images. And then finally, um, the representation of video on computers. Um, 
there's something called the video codec, which stands for compression and decompression of the video, which are the methods used to shrink the size of a movie to allow it to be played in a computer and over a network. <clears throat> That's what the video codec means. And almost all video codecs use lossy compressions to minimize the huge amounts of data associated with video. So if you think about video, it's like having a whole bunch of images, one after the other, and you could be saving them pixel by pixel, or you can be using some kind of algorithm that will determine whether not all the pixels need to be saved, and it will allow us to compress the uh, the video as we represent the, the images. So there's something called the temporal compression and also the spatial compression. So in the temporal compression, for instance, a technique is a technique based on differences between consecutive frames. So if you think about uh, a video as being consecutive images with very few changes between the two, then uh, this temporal compression, what it does, it, it basically um, calculates the difference between the two images and, and that's what it saves. So if most of an image in two frames hasn't changed, so the idea is why should we waste space to duplicate all of the similar information? We should just be able to save the original image and then for future images just save the the um, the differences or what has changed, only the pieces that have changed. That's what temporal compression does. Now there's another one called the spatial compression, which is a technique based on removing the redundant information within a frame. <clears throat> so this problem is essentially the same as that face when compression still images, which is um, why storing the same colors and hues over and over again when we can just um, duplicate them. And typically that's what happens when you, when you do images, that you will find many sections of the image that will have the same color and hues. So that can be saved and, and, and instead of, you, that can be saved once instead of, you know, everywhere where it's being replicated. That's what it means by redundant information. So that pretty much takes care of uh, the whole issue about um, representing graphics or images and, and video, audio and video in a computer.